Hello all, so these videos are going to be looking at the Ford and Carter administrations and then we'll follow up with uh, some, some other videos over the next couple of days on Reagan and George H.W. Bush and Clinton and uh, we can talk a little bit about W. Bush, Bush um, in class. I think as far as the essays are concerned, uh, we'll be pretty good if we have a specific content review of, uh, of all these guys. Um, so, okay. Um, the essential questions I want to ask us is, first off, uh, think about how uh, economic and foreign policies are going to continue to contribute to the disillusionment of Americans in the 1970s. Um, there's definitely a reason, particularly towards the end of Carter's presidency, why the U.S. turns to Reagan. Um, Reagan is much more conservative than a lot of the presidents we've had up until this point. We even see, for example, if we go back to someone like Eisenhower, he was a Republican, but if you remember that policy of moderate or modern Republicanism showed us that he even was willing to continue some New Deal-like policies. So what we're seeing with uh, presidents like Reagan is that, you know, we're really going away from that. So in some ways, we have to sort of ask the question, what went wrong when Ford and Carter were president to cause the United States to swing so much more to the right? Um, and this question in red is, is certainly one that requires historical argumentation uh, in the sense that, you know, when I look at this question, which had the longer legacy on America of Watergate or Nixon's foreign policy in China and the USSR, I really have to think about the overall out, uh, the overall opinions that we hear about Nixon. Um, I truly feel that Presidents Ford and Carter both felt that general sense of disappointment in Washington establishment politics. I don't think this is truly Nixon's fault. I, I surely think that Watergate really stained the United States perception of the president, but I also think that that distrust existed when Johnson was president. But what we really see is that because Ford and Carter also are not really seen as as particularly inspiring. They don't really seem to have really substantial plans for how to improve the economy. I think that shows us that left over from uh, Nixon's Watergate scandal, you know, we really don't have the best view of Washington at this point. All right, so in general, um, the 1970s is not a particularly good decade for the American economy, as we were saying in class. Um, one of the major uh, downturns that we see is this idea called stagflation, which in general is a combination of uh, low economic growth, so we don't see a lot of jobs coming up. Um, we see in general prices are staying high. Um, inflation uh, in is increasing and unemployment is also going up. So basically it's uh, inflation is characterized by the economy not doing much and, and uh, a lack of jobs. Again, like I was saying before, um, the government is really not trusted anymore, and I think this is left over not only from Watergate, but also from uh, the period of escalation during Vietnam with Johnson. Um, what we see is with Ford and Carter, neither president really um, has a sense of passion or a clear direction for where to bring the country. And so in general, you don't really see uh, the country really rallying behind them. I think that does change with Reagan, so we'll talk about that. Um, and we also see that um, that to a certain extent, the 70s sees a revival of some Cold War tension. Uh, this is particularly the case by 1979 when the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan. We see the Cold War sort of ramping back up. Um, so again, as I was saying, the economy is not doing really bad. Uh, there are two major things that contribute to this. Um, the one uh, major contributor to a bad U.S. economy is how oil prices skyrocket. Uh, because of the OPEC oil embargo. And so just remember that in 1973, um, this is during the Yom Kippur War, and the United States was really torn uh, in terms of its position in the Arab-Israeli conflict. On the one hand, they felt the need to have a strong tie to Arab countries because they depended on them for oil exports. But on the other hand, they felt obligated to recognize the newly formed state of Israel. So when the U.S. takes Israel's side in the Yom Kippur War, these oil-producing countries end up responding by issuing an embargo of oil on all countries that support Israel. So basically what we see happen, and you'll see in future slides, uh, what happens to gas prices and, and sort of how this uh, results in an economic crisis. Um, another thing that's contributing to the um, to the negative economy, particularly where oil is concerned, is the Iranian Revolution. Um, so again, we're going to see that 
um, when I when I ran experiences this major political revolution, the U.S. loses a major source of oil, and uh, that affects prices and that affects interest rates. Um, so again, uh, we have these sorry little pop outs here. So again, um, as we know, um, the OPEC oil embargo was to punish Israel's allies, um, and the U.S. was one of them. Um, there's a huge increase on the price of fuel due to the fuel shortage, due to the o OPEC oil embargo, and this is a huge recession. It's actually the worst uh, since the Depression. And uh, this gives us a general sense of what happened uh, to oil prices during the OPEC oil embargo. So the oil embargo starts in earnest in 1973, but it is continuing throughout the 1970s. So even though it starts when Nixon is president, realize that even when Carter is pre president, we're still experiencing the effects of the oil embargo. So um, gas prices are still really, really high, and it contributes to a negative economy. It contributes to the ways in which uh, the United States uh, provides jobs. We see more outsourcing because it's cheaper, and we see the U.S. also relying on uh, more fuel-efficient cars, most of which are not produced in the U.S., so that's bad, too. They rely more on foreign goods. All right, so yeah, you just see uh, what happens to oil prices uh, with these key dates here. Um, and it really did affect uh, ev everyday culture. I mean, it, uh, it may not seem like gas was incredibly expensive at that time, but with inflation, it really was. And what was more important was not even just the price, but the idea that people couldn't get, get gas every day. And so you'd have these huge gas lines, and oftentimes you would actually be turned away at the pump. And so there was just sort of this sense of uh, chaos uh, with regard to a very car-dependent culture. Um, so there we see the peak of the price of oil, and then um, and then ultimately that that oil price is going to is going to decline once we get into the 1980s, which makes us uh, look like the economy is actually going in a more positive direction. But you can see that obviously the price of oil has crept back up again um, more recently. Okay, so uh, basically uh, Nixon actually starts to try to respond to the oil crisis and um, it ha has minimal effects. Um, one of the things that Nixon does is he, um, is he uh, creates the Department of Energy um, and uh, he appoints an energy czar to look over energy consumption. His real goal is to try to decrease the amount of consumption. So things like travel limitations uh, are established. Uh, the U.S. starts to enforce lower speed limits, especially 55 was sort of the key number. And reducing speed limits affected fuel consumption because the faster you drive your car, uh, the less fuel efficient it is. So they, they did this uh, to literally make cars more fuel efficient, but it also had the positive effect of lowering uh, automobile accidents. But what we see is that these efforts do not contribute to uh, lower gas prices. They keep going up. Um, inflation keeps going up. Gas lines uh, keep increasing. And energy prices continue to soar. So Nixon's efforts to institute new energy policies are not going to do anything. Um, so... Uh, and there's going to be an effort to try to find more local sources of oil. That's one thing that changes with the with the U.S.'s approach. Um, they they uh, set the uh, set the plan to dig a a huge oil pipeline from Alaska to the continental U.S. It's over 800 miles long, so it's a major product to ensure domestic sources of oil. Um, but again, as we know, it's not just the oil prices, but it's other things like unemployment, outsourcing that are contributing to um, major problems in the economy. As we were saying before, uh, stagnation is the key word to think about uh, with regard to the state of the economy in the 1970s. Uh, stagflation is a combination of high prices, uh, stagnant economy, high unemployment. Um, and what stagflation does is it really starts to get Americans to question uh, the idea that uh, there would continue to be a sense of progress, especially in uh, in the period after a war. Remember that after World War One and after World War Two, we experienced an economic boom, and so after Vietnam is one of the first times that we see that the economy does not get better. Jobs are not coming uh, are not uh, staying uh, at the same high rates that they were. Um, and uh, you see that in general, Vietnam vets are experiencing more disillusionment than the previous generation of vets, 
um, because A, people didn't really support the war that they were fighting in, and B, they didn't have a solid place in the economy once they returned from combat. Uh, because prices were so high, you're going to experience more and more industries outsourcing their labor, which basically means they start hiring people in foreign countries where labor and environmental restrictions are not as, um, well, labor is, uh, is cheaper and environmental restrictions are, uh, are not really present. Um, so this is even more significant uh, in terms of impacting our economy because we lose jobs um, and... Uh, you know, this is uh, certainly an opportunity for synthesis here because we still see a lot of economic outsourcing, particularly because of free trade deals like NAFTA. Um, so again, we're seeing a ton of inflation throughout the 1970s. Um, there's, again, a steady dependence on foreign oil, those oil shocks that we see happen in the 1970s. And we also have a general decline in the real income of Americans. So just... Uh, just because there is an increased number of people working, we see more and more women, for example, going into the workplace during the 70s. This does not actually mean that Americans are making more money. In fact, the reason why so many women were going into the workplace in the 70s was because they were trying to provide a supplemental income uh, to the traditional male bread uh, winners. So really what we see is that women's income relative to men declines a lot of them go into this uh, workplace and they find only things like clerical and service jobs, which are pretty low paying. So, uh, so yeah, uh, the fact just because there may be more people uh, trying to go into the workplace does not necessarily mean that the economy is better. Again, just uh, signs of inflation here, car prices skyrocketing, and then, you know, more necessities, maybe not hamburgers, but, you know, everyone needed milk, um, everybody needed bread. And so you get a sense of how these necessities uh, were so much more expensive. Um, and when we say there was a decline in real income, what we mean by that is that due to inflation, um, people's wages just did not go up high enough for them to be able to continue to afford these necessities. And here's a silly little graphic that just shows us what stagflation is. Um, neither Ford nor Carter was able to successfully stop uh, stagflation. Um, Carter actually drives up interest rates. And again, as we know, Ford's Whip Inflation Now program um, really did not have a monumental effect on inflation rates because it was largely a volunteer measure. People were just supposed to stop consuming so much uh, based on their own goodwill, which we know doesn't really work as a policy. All right, so let's talk about these, uh, these presidencies here. When Ford was president, first off, just in terms of his general, uh, general approach after Watergate and just his own personality, we see that Ford does not really get, um, get the American public to restore its confidence in the presidency. One of the first things Ford does when he comes into the White House is he pardons Nixon for, for the Watergate scandal. And a lot of people sort of felt like he did this too soon. I mean, Nixon really had a very bad reputation coming out of the White House. And when Ford pardoned him, that meant that, you know, any further investigation of Watergate wasn't going to happen. Um, and it sort of made a lot of Americans think that that sort of insider, you know, uh, Washington um, sort of sketchy behavior was something that Ford almost even encouraged. Um, we're also going to see that um, he is, he attempts to uh, sort of revive the strength of the CIA. He actually uh, reveals a number of instances when the CIA attempted to, um, to assassinate uh, certain figures in Cold War politics. Um, he tries to reorganize the CIA by appointing George H.W. Bush to organize it. And that's significant because that's one of the reasons why George H.W. Uh, Bush gets uh, so prominent in politics later and why he eventually becomes president. Um, and another thing that's important about Ford is that he's sort of representing a, um, a, um, an end of that New Deal coalition type politics because he vetoes a whole bunch of great society uh, programs. Um, so basically what we see is that Ford doesn't really have a clear program. Um, the only thing that he tries to do is hold down spending. But again, as we know, with the Whip Inflation Now program, he did that on a voluntary basis. So that didn't really uh, help the nation's economy. 
Um, in the 1976 campaign, uh, we see that people are obviously um, dissatisfied with Ford, uh, but they're not really that enthusiastic about Carter either. So it would be sort of a, an oversight for us to say that Carter really uh, was able to inspire the electorate. But rather what he did do was start to uh, appeal to um, appeal to uh, some more moderate um, and sometimes even conservatives um, to vote for the Democratic Party. So, uh, so the reason why Jimmy Carter was able to gain more moderate or even conservative voters was because he was what we call a blue dog Democrat. So a blue dog Democrat is typically Southern. Uh, they tend to have more moderate and sometimes even some sort of conservative views, uh, but they are a Democrat by nature. So they're sort of appealing more to that kind of traditional sense of the Democrat almost going way back to the days of somebody like, you know, Andrew Johnson in a way. They still believed in the New Deal coalition, um, but uh, they also um, tended to be a little bit more, um, they, they tended to be a little bit more uh, evangelical in their in their religious views. Uh, so Jimmy Carter was a born-again Christian, so he definitely appealed to, to, more, um, to more conservatives in that way. Um, and, uh, you know, he, uh, he also was, uh, was seen as sort of, a Washington outsider. Um, a lot of people after their experience with Nixon and, and, and Ford were really looking for someone that wasn't sort of tainted by by Washington. So they picked Carter, who did not have a career in Washington. He was a peanut farmer. Um, and, you know, he was seen as really humble. Like when he was inaugurated in 1977, he actually got out of the limo and, and walked alongside of it, uh, which sort of reminds us of some of the previous presidents from the very beginning of the Republic who really wanted to maintain an informal status. Um, so, you know, there were a lot of people that were attracted to that. But still, his victory was narrow, right? And some of it also was because Ford did certain things that made him look bad, uh, you know, in the, in the campaign in 1976. So he said, for example, that there was no Soviet domination of Eastern Europe, which you know, we know was obviously um, was obviously not true because at this point during the Cold War, uh, the Soviet Union did have significant influence over all those satellite states in, in Eastern Europe. It was preventing them from having uh, democratic elections. That was really, really an overstatement uh, by Carter. And again, these are images that show us, or, sorry, by Ford rather, that was an overstatement by Ford saying that. Um, and then these images just kind of show us again that down-to-earth nature of, uh, of, the, of the rural peanut farmer, um, Jimmy Carter. But if you look here, we notice that um, that it isn't a landslide victory by any means in terms of the uh, in terms of the popular vote. It was pretty close, um, and Jimmy Carter, as you can see, is able to sort of confusing. I know because Democratic is red in this one, so sorry. Um, but you can see that Jimmy Carter has a pretty good handle on the South as well as some rural states up here. Um, but by no means does he have the uh, does he have an overwhelming majority. Um, and as we know, uh, again, just like just like Ford, Carter doesn't really have a clear sense of direction either. Um, he is not really able to get a lot of legislation through Congress. Um, he sort of seems uninterested in um, in dealing with the legislature after a while. Um, he doesn't really like that give and take process of the of the system of checks and balances. Um, and so what we see is that uh, he attempts to reform welfare and social security, but he can't do that because he doesn't get along. Uh, well enough with Congress to do that. Um, he doesn't figure out a, an effective strategy to stop the soaring inflation, the, uh, the increasing interest rates, and some of the bank failures uh, that were hurting the economy. Um, so his greatest legacy actually was in terms of promoting human rights uh, worldwide. So we're going to talk about that more. But um, in, a lot of, uh, in a lot of other ways, we see that his programs really don't stimulate the economy. Um, and what Carter tries to do then is he tries to say that Americans were experiencing a crisis in confidence. He gave the speech in 1979, um, sort of said that, um, you know, in general, um, that was one of the reasons why the economy wasn't st simulated, because Americans were not confident enough they were not actually using their purchasing power. If you remember, again, for th synthesis sake, um, go back to FDR and his fireside chats during the Great Depression. One of the main things he was trying to do with those fireside chats was inspire people to have the confidence, again, to go outside and spend their money. Right. So Jimmy Carter was trying to do the same thing by uh, giving the crisis and confidence speech. He was trying to say, look, you guys, you just have to have faith in the market that it's going to recover, and it will. Um, but when he said crisis and confidence, people... Uh, sort of took that the wrong way and interpreted that um, as 
Carter sort of saying that um, that the people were to blame for Carter's own failures. And uh, we sort of see that by 1980, he's sort of washed up uh, in terms of foreign affairs as well. Um, and that's one of the major reasons why people vote for Reagan instead of him. Um, so uh, let's, just for the sake of having a break, we'll, uh, we'll stop here and then we'll talk about Carter's human rights policies and his foreign policy in a second and final video here. And then the next sets of videos will be about Reagan. So stay tuned.